Okay, everyone, let's get going. So I'll put this on video as well. Uh, the homework one is based on uh, orbiting around Earth. Sorry, we forgot to specify that, but we haven't talked about any other planets so far. So mu is the mu of the Earth. Every constant you use is Earth-based, okay? Uh, thanks for the question. Someone brought it up today. So don't look at that for now. We'll look at it in a second. So I am going to complete here uh, the uh, orbital position. I'm going to rewrite it here as a function of time. As I said, without going through too many demonstrations, because I decided that uh, they don't add much value to what we're doing. You're not going to see them again. They are in your book, and it's a lot of algebra that uh, I would rather not go through this time. So uh, we did the circular one. Let's refresh where we are. So we start from this equation, mu squared over h cubed t, assuming that time at perigee is 0. That's when you start counting time. So this is equal to the integral between 0 and a generic true anomaly of this function of theta. And uh, depending on uh, the e value, this integral has a closed form solution for all values of e, 0, between 0 and 1, and above 1. But they do change uh, n equal to 1. Uh, these solutions change depending on, uh, on e. And they are very long and very annoying expressions that I'm not going to copy on the board. Uh, because again, I'm not going through the steps. But for a circular orbit, uh, it's, it's uh, very simple. It's analytical. Time and true anomaly are more or less the same thing. You're moving on a circle at a constant rate. Uh, we said that theta is equal to 2 pi over the orbital period times t. And that's the end of the story. So if you give me a true anomaly, you can also compute time. If you give me a time, you can tell me the true anomaly. It's, it's, they are equivalent other than a constant here, right? OK, uh, for elliptical, uh, you have to be patient with me because as I will skip the steps, I have all the steps in the notes. I want to focus on the main results. So it will take me a little bit of time to find them. Um, OK, so for elliptical, you have, I'll give you the result right away that connects the quantities uh, theta and t, which is the following. M e uh, called mean anomaly. I'll tell you what that is in a second. Is equal to capital E minus eccentricity sine of capital E. So this is mean anomaly, and this is called eccentric anomaly. And we'll have to define this thing. Let me erase this. I don't want to bring up the screen. So to get to that, there is a lot of algebra um, involved, nothing special. But uh, the quantities you're looking at are the following. Mean anomaly includes time. It's, uh, well, it's 2 pi over t time, nothing special. Mean anomaly is 2 pi over orbital period times t. Um, now, keep in mind that this is not, for a circular orbit, you can call this the angular velocity of that point that moves. I mean, a point doesn't have an angular velocity, but uh, the angular velocity of the radius that moves uh, around, pointing at the satellite. Uh, this, th that's not constant for an ellipse, right? We know that. So this is called mean motion. It's a mean angular velocity, if you want, but it's not constant throughout the elliptical orbit. So that's what ME is. And uh, the eccentric anomaly is a constructed angle that allows you to find the solution. This is an equation that we'll, we'll play with a little bit. So if you look at your elliptical orbit, uh, where do I put it here? Let's put it here. Line of ups, your planet, what we call M1, or the focus, the occupied focus of the ellipse. Okay, of course I picked the wrong spot. 
Um, all right, so that's, uh, let's look at a genetic position of your satellite, M2. I'm not going to write anything here. Position vector R. And imagine uh, that you're also building an imaginary circle that goes, it's not going to fit in the board, but it doesn't matter. I don't need the entire thing. That has a radius of A. Okay? It's a circle that contains the ellipse and goes through perigee and apogee. Of course, if this semi-major axis is 2A, the radius of this circle is A, and this is what we called, uh, you've seen in the video lectures, the point C, the midpoint between perigee and apogee. So if you elongate this position vector, you continue to draw the vector and you intersect this circle at a point Q, and then connect C with Q. This, so this angle is what we call the true anomaly, right? This is theta. Well, this angle here, P, C, Q, this is E, the eccentric anomaly. It's a geometrical construct that allows you to get to that equation. And of course, you're asking yourself, okay, this guy wants to connect time and true anomaly. I don't see true anomaly in there. Of course, there is a relationship between theta and E. Uh, but to get to that equation that we can solve uh, numerically, uh, we need to go through uh, the definition of E, which is defined as, as you see on the board, nothing, nothing more. Of course, true anomaly and uh, eccentric anomaly do collapse to the same angle if you have a circle, right? And, uh, and guess what happens if you have a circle, this goes to zero, and you have, again, what we just, I just erased, you have 2 pi over P times T equals to what? To theta, because E collapses to theta. Do we see that, the, that E and theta become the same thing if the ellipse becomes a circle? Of course, they have to be the same thing, because your mass M1 is going to move to C. Okay. Now, what is missing is that relationship between uh, E and theta. And without demonstration, this is what it is. Two arctangent of square root of 1 minus E over 1 plus E tangent of theta over 2. Believe me to get through these formulas and demonstrate that it will take an entire lecture, so, uh, and it's not that much fun. Uh, but there is a relationship between theta and time, as you can see. This contains theta, is, E is just another ugly way to write theta, uh, and ME, the mean anomaly, contains time. So we do have this equation, which has a name. This is called Kepler's equation. Now, if I give you a true anomaly, I pick theta equals pi over 2, just an angle, and, uh, and you want to compute time, that's a little bit of calculations, but uh, not a big deal, right? Substitute theta in here, right? You get your eccentric anomaly. Everything is in radians, okay? When you actually implement this or solve it with your calculator, be careful uh, what kind of angles you're using. Um, theta goes in here, compute this arctangent, and you get the eccentric anomaly, and then you go here, you will know, of course, the eccentricity of your elliptical orbit, and uh, compute this right-hand side, it will give you the mean anomaly, which gives you time. Right? No brainer. Give me a theta, I'll give you time right away. Uh, the problem with that equation is the opposite. If uh, I want to know at a certain time where you are, so if I give you t, 100 seconds, and uh, you need to compute the true anomaly, the position of the satellite on the given elliptical orbit, then uh, it is a little more involving. You need to go to still this equation. Uh, if you are given the left-hand side and you want to compute the unknown, which is big E, is not... Uh, it's not that simple. You have to solve that numerically. And of course, there is an inverse for, uh, for this expression, if you want. Uh, and we will see how this can be solved numerically with, um, you have to find the zero of this function, right? Is everybody following? No? Is there anything that is not clear? Give you time. Look at that equation like this. Forget about the fact that the mean anomaly has to do with time and E is an, an angle. 
is, is basically solving an equation where you have a equals to x minus e sine of x. Or if you want to write in a different way, where this is a constant given, this is a constant, is given, and you want to find the x. That is the problem I'm describing here. If you give me time and you want to know the true anomaly, you have to go through this equation, find first the mean anomaly, then, in, then look at the inverse of this. Well, again, we'll look at it in, in, in MATLAB, which is much easier, in my opinion. Uh, and then eventually you find theta. But the main problem is solving this, which doesn't have a, yes? In, Are we looking at this? Yes. And this is just one equation. Yes, and that's for elliptical. elliptical that's only elliptical. So well, it works also for circular. If you just stick E equals zero there, it works, but it has an analytical solution, no matter if you give me T or, or theta. Okay, so how yeah. does that compare to the one on the top left one? This one? Yes. That's just the definition of mean anomaly. So I could just take this and put it there so that you oh. see explicitly time, which is yeah, a good point. So this equation is equivalent. Actually, let's leave it here. Mean anomaly. Okay, um, it is perfectly equivalent to writing 2 pi over orbital period times t equals big E minus little e sine of big E. It's the same equation, it's just that uh, that 2 pi over t, big T times little t is called me. Yep. Um, so, do we see the point here? Uh, I am giving you this quantity here. I'm giving you a T star, for example. So this thing is given. It's a constant. And then you have to find big E to begin with. Then we'll talk about theta. But the first step is finding big E. That's how, that's how it is solved. And it's equivalent to solving, finding the zero of a function. Doesn't have an analytical solution. There are approximate solutions for this in your book that require a series, um, infinite series. But the bottom line is this doesn't have a, an analytical solution. You have to find it numerically. How do you find zeros of functions numerically? You've seen this in other classes probably. There are many ways, iterative procedures. Do you remember the name of one of them, maybe? Yeah, I think I'm using the Newton method in MATLAB, but yeah, they're all equivalent. It's, uh, it's not a difficult uh, solution to find because, let's look now at my, uh, at the book, this is why I like having the electronic version of the book. We can look at the exact pages. So that first image right there is, I don't know what to do, fit with maybe. Let's see if I can go there. Okay, uh, this is just showing you the relationship that I have here. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, well, I didn't write it down. Uh, it's mean anomaly and theta. So. E is connected to theta through that equation. So you can look at this as me is a function of big E or theta, it's equivalent. This is just to show that it's monotonic. You change, you change the value of E. For E equals zero, you have a straight line. And for all other values of E, you have curved lines that go down as you increase the eccentricity and then go up that way. But they are monotonic. Basically, uh, there is no, um, they constantly go up. The constant increase with increase of true anomaly. But the uh, real one that we want to look at is another one. If I find it, maybe I should make it small again. Yes. Okay, this one here, which is exactly the equation that I want to solve with you in MATLAB. Okay. So this is plotting this uh, function right here with the uh, mean anomaly on the y axis and the big E on the x-axis. And so, again, I want to find the zero of this. Again, I'm just rewriting it this way. If you give me time, what you're going to do is you're going to give me me, right? So you're going to just come in with some value of me here on the y-axis. Are you following? And you need to intersect one of these curves. Each one of these is for a different value of eccentricity. And need to find that point where the horizontal line for a certain value of me uh, intersects one of these lines, the one that corresponds to the eccentricity you have, and that allows you to find the corresponding e. Make sense? But again, that, that cannot be done 
in a closed form way, but the fact that all these curves, it doesn't matter what the E value is, they are monotonic, again, they just constantly go up, it means there is only one zero. So just focus your attention, for example, to uh, on, um, let's see, eccentricity, I don't know, one of these, this one, or even the last one, and forget about the other ones. It doesn't matter what ME value you're going to give me, it's going to have just one intersection with that line, which means there is a, a unique solution, so it's pretty easy to find it numerically, if you want, with any method you've studied, the algorithm you use is going to converge to that solution quickly, without any problems. There's no risks of finding other solutions that don't exist. Is everybody following here? So maybe I should, yes, there's a question there. Uh, is the question how E is moving? E is changing, so theta is following what, whatever it has to do on that trajectory. That doesn't change. This additional angle that I have defined um, is going to move uh, according to this equation. So if you give me a theta, this is the ugly equation that will tell me what E is doing. Well, so I guess the question is, what if instead of, if I understand correctly, what if I forget theta and I want to represent what's happening to the orbit with big E? Yeah. Um, you can. I think the, all the relationships that we have found, radius as a function of theta, velocity as a function of theta, I have never seen anyone expressing those as a function of big E. Uh, the, the only reason why this big E is introduced is because Maybe I should write it here, so that, that will make a little more sense. It's because in the process of solving that integral that I removed, you get to a complex equation where all these tangents and arc tangents exist, and so the, the artifact of introducing this angle allows me to find this simpler, nicer equation to solve, other than having a bunch of tangents of arc tangents, but there's no physical... It's, it's, you, can, you can think about it this way. It's, uh, it's a, an auxiliary variable that is introduced to find a nicer equation. It has no physical meaning that you can really relate to. No physical use that is better than, or alternative to theta. I wouldn't use the mean anomaly to represent the position of a satellite because what you have to do, uh, you will have to, you can. Uh, you, you, you will have to imagine constantly this circle that has a radius of A, uh, given E, you find this point Q, then you have to go down and intersect with the ellipse. It just makes it very convoluted. Uh, the only reason why the ano uh, eccentric anomaly exists is to find this equation here, bottom line. Make sense? Yeah. Yep. It's just a change of variable. Instead of using theta, I use E to solve this, and then once I solved it, I go back to theta. Uh, let's actually look at how you, you, you do everything that I've told you. Uh, in practice, because again, it, it requires, which one is it? Uh, Kepler, Kepler equation. It does require numerical solution. So I, I'll, I'll repeat the steps. If, uh, maybe I should write them here. You may have two different problems. Problem one, given theta find t, and this is absolutely straightforward. Agree with that? You basically uh, compute big E with this expression here. You don't have to memorize these things, but you need to know that they exist. Compute big E from theta, and then compute from Kepler's equation, right? Because in the case of giving theta, you are given the right-hand side, you can find the left-hand side, which is basically time other than a constant. Then problem two is given <coughs> T find theta, and you have to numerically solve
Kepler's equation for E. And so that's the first step. And then find theta given the relationship between the two, which I'm going to show here. Uh, OK. And the same story will uh, show up for hyperbolic orbits, but let's look at this one first. Kepler, Kepler, OK. So this is the function. I'm going to start from the function that I want to solve first. This is a function in MATLAB that implements that equation. E minus little e sine of e minus mean anomaly. I want to find the zero of that. OK? So it's, it's, that is the function that represents this, where y is the output, but I want that y to become zero. So outside of this function, I'm going to call it in a way that will find the zero of it. And uh, let's see what, what example I have. I think I have the same example we saw last time, an initial position, an initial velocity. I go through computing h, computing e, computing the norm of e, radius of perigee, radius of apogee, same as your axis, period, definitely the orbital period. And so here I have a time desired. So the, the, the problem number one is really not, not that interesting. Problem number two is what I'm trying to solve here. So this is the core of solving that problem number two. You tell me at desired time. I want to know the true anomaly at that time for this elliptical orbit. And let's prove that it's elliptical. Just in case. You never know. I may have changed some values. Yeah. It's definitely pretty elliptical, almost parabola. Um, and at half the orbital period, I want to find the theta. Would I need to solve numerically, if that's the question? Just let's pause for a second. Let's forget about solving the Kepler's equation numerically. If I tell you that I want to know the true anomaly at half the orbital period, do I actually need to go through that pain? What is the true anomaly at half orbital period? It's apogee, right? But I'm going to do it anyways. I can change that time. I can make it 3t. Actually, let's do that, because this is not. Uh, let's, let's confirm that it works, and then we'll do it for another value. So these are the steps. Compute the mean anomaly. Fine. It is pi, uh, as it should be. Uh, and then, a, as you solve numerically uh, for the zero of a function, you need to start from some point, right? You have to give it an initial guess for the solution. You need to start from somewhere, and then the iterative process will look for that solution. And so I start from zero. It doesn't matter. You can start from any allowable uh, initial uh, eccentric anomaly, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the corresponding eccentric anomaly given that time. Uh, you can start from any between 0 and pi because I know that these are monotonic functions, so it will, no matter what, it will converge to the solution. It should. And so I find the 0 of at e, e is the variable to iterate on of this function right here. Okay? So I'm calling the f0 MATLAB function, which I think uses the Newton's method to find the zero of a function with this initial guess, uh, with these constants that go through, and uh, it found pi. Guess what? Everything is pi here, because now it just picked a sweet, sweet spot, which is half the orbital period. Um, I just convert in degrees, just to see it in degrees, 180. And then if you invert this expression here, which you can do, uh, you find a very similar function that basically gives you theta as a function of e. It's just inverting this one. Uh, it's perfectly invertible, uh, so that gives me the true anomaly, which is pi. Okay, and then here I'm doing just a little bit of correction. If the true anomaly ends up being less than zero, which it can happen, because this is an arctangent function, I'm just fixing for that because I don't want to see negative true anomalies. And then I just spit it out in degrees, which is 180. OK. Uh, if theta is given, yeah, again, that's not interesting at all, so I'm not going to run that. Uh, but for example, any other location, I don't know, t over 3, some other time, uh, will give me a different angle. OK. Run this all the way down. I don't have to stop here uh, to that point. See, it runs very quickly. It's, it's really. It is numerical, but the solution is found Im immediately. And so this is, uh, what is it? It should be less, 168 degrees. Just 
I just picked a random number. Everything makes sense here? So again, these are the two problems. This is not fun at all. This is a little more involving. You give me time. You find theta through solving the Klepper's equation numerically. You find big E that corresponds to that time. And then inverting this, which is in your code, I'll give you all this. You find the true anomaly. OK. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to do the parabolic and hyperbolic even quicker than this. The parabolic is also not very interesting because he has an analytical solution. So there's nothing to do other than using the results. So we'll erase that after. Parabolas. They are ugly, but they are analytical. Let's see where I put them. They're here. Well, to make a long story short, you'll find what is called Barker's equation, where there is no mean anomaly. What people introduce is the parabolic anomaly, which is equal to 1 over 2 tangent of theta over 2 plus 1 over 6 tangent cubed of theta over 2. And uh, this parabolic anomaly is simply mu squared over h cubed t. I can't relate this to any orbital period. There is no orbital period for the parabola. It never comes back, right? Um, so, story is the same. If you give me a theta, you want to find time, done. Substitute theta here. You find this mp, which is nothing else than time other than this constant, and you're done. But the opposite is also solvable um, in, a, uh, in a closed form, because if you this is a cubic expression if you do the opposite. If you give me time, you have a constant here. And so if you call, uh, if you, for a second, if you imagine that you call tangent of theta over 2 just x, the equation that you're going to solve is mp, which is known, is equal to 1 over 2x plus 1 over 6x cubed. It's a cubic expression that does have a solution. And this is the solution. And we'll just stop there. I'm not even going to run a problem because it's, a, it's just a function. Uh, it's long though. Let's see if I can fit it in here. 3mp plus square root of 3mp squared plus 1, everything to 1 over 3. I hope I can erase this. I need this. And I'm not done. Minus 3mp plus 3mp squared plus 1 minus 1 over 3. And done. And there you're done. So again, if you're given time, which means you give an MP, substitute here, you'll find the tangent of theta over 2 invert for theta, and you're done. Everything is closed form. There's no numerical iterations. Nothing. It's not fun. But that's what it is. So again, I'm skipping the steps because um, they're very long. And I don't think they add a lot of value to what, what we need to know. We just need to know that for circle and parabola, everything is analytical. There is a direct relationship between time and theta. Uh, for elliptical and hyperbolic paths, which we're going to see next, is not uh, that simple. So for a hyperbolic path, you will find something similar. Oh, we're not going to find it. We just see that it's something similar, except since it's an hyperbolic path, there's going to be hyperbolic sines and cosines. Yes? Did I make a mistake? The last expression, that's a negative function? Yeah, it's negative. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, otherwise, that would be the same thing. No, yeah, this is, this is 1 over 3. So it's square, uh, cube, cube root here. And this is cube root at the denominator. OK? You're still copying this stuff? In the meantime. Everything is in the book, as we know. Surprises here. I'm just collecting everything in the same spot so that you have it. So Kepler hyper, always make a joke. Seems like on steroids or something, but that's what it is. Um, so for a hyperbolic path, can I erase this? Hyperbolic, we have to also solve something numerically. I should erase this once and for all. Uh, 
let's see, what are the main equations that we need to use? Here it is. So there is something very similar to what we had before for uh, um, the ellipse. The hyperbolic anomaly is equal to E hyperbolic sine of some f value, which is not even an angle, minus f. Uh, I can call that hyperbolic anomaly. This is nothing else than Kepler's equation again, but it's for a hyperbolic path. Uh, where, let's see what we have here. If you want, I'll, I'll just draw something to define f in a second, but I want to give you the relationship because that's of course, that is of course not uh, the true anomaly. So f and the true anomaly are connected this way. There is a logarithm here of a very long expression, so I'm not sure it's going to fit in here. f is ln of e plus 1 plus e plus 1 tangent of theta over 2 e plus 1 minus square root of e minus 1 tangent of theta over 2. So there is a relationship between the two. And sine hyperbolic of f is defined the following way. Okay, if these are your asymptotes, bless you, line of ups, this is the uh, branch of the hyperbola where there is actually a satellite flying, and you look at the attracting planet and you go through a generic position, R, okay? If you draw the line which is parallel to the line of ups uh, at the satellite, and call this distance between line of ups and this line uh, y. And then from perigee you do the same thing. You go vertical here to this point and call this distance b. That h is defined by the following. Hyperbolic sine of f is y over b. So the reason why I'm skipping the steps is just there's a bunch of uh, changes of variables and defi definition of convenient quantities that are just for the purpose of finding this Kepler equation. Doesn't matter if it's for hyperbolic path or the elliptical one. So there's really no dynamics here. There's just algebra involved in defining all these quantities. And the bottom line is that I want to find theta if you give me time. Okay, so same story. If you give me a uh, theta value, well, here it is. It goes in here, it goes into F, it goes into this equation, and you find time. And I haven't defined MH, but it's, uh, it is also a function of time. And I do believe, let me double check, it's identical to what we had before. Where is it? I don't have it. Hmm. Lost it. Uh, here it is. No, it's not identical. It's almost. There's always a mu squared over h cubed, but then you also have e squared minus 1, 3 over 2t. These formulas, forget about memorizing them. They are what they are. So, uh, once again, theta is given. You go here, find f, compute the right hand side. You have time, because these are all constants here. Do we remember what is uh, hyperbolic sign? Anyone? No? Anyone wants to tell me? What is a hype? How do you compute the hyperbolic sign or hyperbolic cosine? How are they defined? One over two? Yeah. Well, I have it here if you don't uh, want to memorize that. You probably see it somewhere, right? No, because MATLAB actually has those functions. Um, hyperbolic sine, 
So you really don't need to remember this because MATLAB does it for you, but it's uh, of f is e to the f minus e to the minus f, believe, and the cosine is with the plus. Anyways, it is what it is. So how do you solve for the interesting problem where time is given? Well, as we've done before, I have just picked a different orbit here where the velocity is a little higher so that I can go on a hyperbolic path, and let's verify that. So if I run this example, uh, yeah, E is bigger than, greater than 1. And uh, I'm also computing, so I think the way I've set up this example is on a special case, like I, I did before for t, uh, t over 2. Do you remember what theta infinity is? Have you watched those videos? What is theta infinity for a hyperbola? R goes, as you start from perigee, you go up, you go up, you go up, you go to infinity. So when your position becomes parallel to the asymptote, that's what we call theta infinity, right? It's basically the angle of the direction of the... Uh, asymptote with respect to the line of ups. Remember that? Okay. And it was given as the arc cosine of minus 1 over e, if you go back to, those, uh, uh, to that video. I'm here converting it as well uh, into degrees, 131 degrees for this particular hyperbolic path. And so what I did here is uh, I solved numerically for that equation, again, uh, the Kepler's equation. So I have given a desired time, which as you can see, it's, it's pretty high. I don't even know how many zeros I have. Three, six, nine, a lot. It's a lot of time. It's a very long time. Uh, because I wanted to see if the solution actually gives me th theta infinity or something close, and I think it does. Uh, so let's, let's do it. Um, okay. This is MH, this is the hyperbolic uh, anomaly, right here, that equation. So this is given, becomes a constant, you need to solve for this equation in terms of f. And there is nothing new with respect to what we've done before, except that the new function f to the fine has a hyperbolic sign in, in it, but it's the same approach as before. I am looking for the zero of this, I want to find the point given MH, the value for mh, the point f, where y goes to zero. And the same story holds for this. It's a, it's a monotonic behavior, so there is only one solution. You can start at zero as initial guess. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. So you find the zero with f zero again, eccentric anomaly. You can invert, oh, I'm checking this in degrees. I don't really care what it is. Uh, there is the inverse of this which I didn't write on the board, but you will have it on the, in the code. The true anomaly is given by this expression as a function of the eccentric anomaly. Note that this is an hyperbolic tangent. So there is always a way to invert this expression as we did before. And uh, whatever the value is, then I convert into degrees and hopefully it's pretty close, 131, 50, 92. Yeah. So within the approximation of MATLAB, I am looking at, this, at, the, uh, at infinity, right? With that very high time. And uh, uh, just for fun, if I set this to zero, you know what? It's a good idea, never erase numbers that you want to reuse. What, uh, what should I get if I put zero? Zero time. Remember, we assume that, what, what did we assume when we started at the beginning? Zero is what? The time of perigee. So what theta should I get? Zero. Yeah. I hope it works. If it doesn't work, I am fired. All right, it works. Zero. It's good to test your algorithm on special cases. That's, that's why I picked that very high time. I knew that I should get, I should have obtain something um, similar to theta infinity going with a very high time. And of course, zero, I know it's another special case that I can easily check. And then the points in between, I have no way to say at 
500 seconds I should expect this angle. I really can't imagine that easily. But theta infinity and zero, yes. Uh, sanity checks. Any questions on this? Um, I believe at some point we'll use this as part of a homework, maybe. Uh, but the bottom line, the takeaway from this topic, which is orbital position as a function of time, is that we started saying that h is constant, e is constant. Those give you uh, a way to freeze the plane and the shape of the orbit in that plane. Uh, but we solved for theta at some point, so we forgot about time for a while. And now we're bringing time back into the picture, and that's how we do it. For a circle and a parabola, it's very easy. There is a direct relationship, analytical relationship between theta and t. For uh, elliptical and hyperbolic trajectories, uh, you go through the Kepler equation, which has a slightly different form depending on uh, elliptical or hyperbolic path, and they both require numerical solution if you want to find a position given a time. The vice versa is analytical. So, just the procedure is something you have to keep in mind. It's outlined in this code. I'll give you the code. And that's, that is really the end of the story for relating theta and t. That's how it's done. Any questions? So, uh, next time, I will start introducing different quantities called orbital parameters that still have to do with these ideal orbits, but they allow us to represent their orientation in space and shape in a more geometrical and intuitive way. Uh, three of those are basically all angles uh, that you probably are familiar with. Um, so we'll introduce those. And in terms of the test, which is next week, right, Wednesday, uh, I would say that we'll cover everything until Friday, probably, in the test. Not whatever we'll do on Monday will not be there. Um, but the level of questions should be whatever you're training on uh, in the homework, except no MATLAB needed, of course. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you.